I'd like you all to close your eyes. Closed? Okay, now you can't see me right now, but I'm actually riding a unicycle, juggling hundreds of balls. <laughs> no, keep your eyes closed though, it's really great, but... Okay, so close your eyes and picture an engineer. Everyone got a picture in their head? Nod, do you? Okay, open your eyes. Raise your hand if you pictured a guy sitting alone at a computer. Okay, maybe kind of nerdy, pocket protector. <laughs> Raise your hand if you pictured a train driver. <laughs> That's a lot of hands. Raise your hand if you pictured a young guy in a hoodie. Maybe he looks a little like Mark Zuckerberg, perhaps. <laughs> Raise your hand if you pictured someone who looks like me. Okay, not a lot of hands. Well, if you didn't raise your hand for me, I'd like you to please get up and leave. <laughs> no, just kidding. If you didn't raise your hand for me, it's all right. I get it all the time. Usually when I tell people I'm an engineer, they look at me and they say, ha, no, really, what do you do? <laughs> Or uh, they look at me and say, oh, whoa, you must be some kind of genius. Or my favorite is when I told my mother I wanted to major in engineering. She said, ew, why? <laughs> <laughs> the truth is I'm a female engineer and I'm a minority. Only 11% of engineers in the US are women. So why does this matter? Why do we care? So what, let's just have the men do all the engineering. Well, engineers are making some of the biggest advances in our society. They're solving things like global warming, making medical breakthroughs, some of the biggest technologies that are changing our lives. These are things that we use every day as people that make our lives better. And with half the population being female, we deserve to have the female perspective. It'll only get better with the female perspective. But today, engineering really is a boys club and I don't fit in. But I'm here today to share my story about how I discovered a passion for engineering, and I'm here to make a bold claim. I don't fit in, but I believe that our little girls will. So this is me when I was a little girl, age six. I was a pretty normal kid. I loved ballet and drawing and riding bikes. I grew up in a small town in Rhode Island age six. Coincidentally, this is around the age where most girls start to lose an interest in math and science, this young. And it's interesting, some people think, well, biologically, maybe girls just aren't as good at those subjects, and that's just the way it is, you can't fight nature. Well, there was a study done very recently across 65 countries around the world where they tested boys and girls on the same science test, Around the world, girls outperformed the boys, but not in the US. What this study suggests is that it's not a biological thing. This is a cultural thing. And this is our culture. This is what we grow up in as girls, the toy aisle, the perfect example of our culture, where we are taught from a very young age that we want to become princesses. I remember when I was a little girl, adults would pat me on the head well, actually, I come from a Jewish family, so they would grab me by the punum and say, <laughs> Debbie, you are so smart. Good for you. And I remember as a little girl being so disappointed, wishing that they told me I was pretty. I wanted to be pretty. I didn't want to be smart. And by the time my senior year of high school rolled around, I was applying to college, and I asked my math teacher to write my recommendation letter. And she said, OK, Debbie, well, what do you plan to major in? I'll write it in the letter. And I said, I don't know. She said, how about engineering? I think you would really excel in it. And I thought, engineering. I closed my eyes, and I pictured a train driver. <laughs> I had no idea what engineering was, and I was way too embarrassed to ask her. I didn't want to sound stupid, but I thought, ugh, no way, ew, engineering. That's for boys, it's intimidating and, and boring, and why would she ever think that a creative, artistic girl like me would ever like engineering? No way. But I went off to Stanford, which was a big deal. In my high school, they actually announced it over the loudspeaker. <laughs> and when I got to Stanford my freshman year, I had no idea what to major in. 
And that, that message that that math teacher had said, engineering, you should give it a try, it stuck in my head. And so I thought, what the heck? I'm gonna take ME 101, just give it a try, because I couldn't change. It's so critical that you do something that you enjoy um, because then you can enjoy life, have fun with your career and that's what's really important. I'm Julie Shutterworth, I'm the General Manager at Fortescue Solomon Mine in the Pilbara of North West Western Australia. I'm responsible for the 1,750 people and managing a budget of $1 billion each year. So I really loved science at high school. I loved everything from geology to chemistry to astronomy. I loved rocks and the landscapes, big trucks and I wanted to do something that combined all of that. But it wasn't until I'd actually spent one year at university and spent the university holidays on a mine site working where I actually realised I love this, it's in my blood, I really want to work in the mining industry. So we produce approximately 170 million tonnes of iron ore per year at three different hubs in the Pilbara and we rail that to Port Hedland and ship it overseas for steel making. So a metallurgist is responsible for the chemical and physical processes of extracting metal from the rock. So in terms of gold mining, that's making gold bars out of the rock. So one of my first memories was actually pouring a gold bar and seeing that coming out of the rock was absolutely amazing. So my career's progressed from being a metallurgist, very technical in the field, hands-on, producing metals out of the ore body, to now where I'm doing is the general management of the whole site. Giving back is really important to me, so I mentor approximately 30 young women now through various stages of their career. For me, it's really important to be able to do that, inspire them. I've had a great career, a lot of fun at the same time, a lot of help. I ended up working in Africa, in Tanzania, in East Africa for 10 years and my career journey there went from being a metallurgist to a senior metallurgist to a process superintendent to then be a process plant manager at the age of 30. In Africa I was able to contribute back to the community. We built schools, water wells, electrical and um, water and power infrastructure for the local communities and we really helped with the education there. Protecting the environment is really critical and we've got a whole environmental department of environmental scientists and environmental engineers that are really making sure that we comply with all the legal environmental obligations of our mining leases and also reclaiming our mine sites afterwards to leave them as best as we can after we've finished mining there is also a really important part of the scope of the environmental team and the management team. I believe it's really important for us to give back and help the younger generation and be role models and inspire them. Here in Australia we've um, able to train up and develop about a thousand Aboriginal people that had never worked in mining and that's getting back to the communities in the Pilbara. So I'm really glad I pursued my passion because clearly I've been able to have a great career with what I was interested in doing. My name is Madeleine de Tui. I'm currently employed as a professor at the University of Wollongong in the Welding Engineering Research Group. I always liked science and mathematics growing up, so I always considered a career in science or technology. But I never really thought about engineering until I spoke to a school gui guidance counsellor in high school and he suggested engineering. And I liked the idea. My father's an engineer, he's a mechanical engineer who spent most of his life working for the South African Railways. And um, he inspired me. My proudest achievements, I think the first would be being elected as the president of the Southern African Institute of Welding. I served two terms as president from 2010 onwards, and that was a great opportunity to interact with industry and with, with welding people and to give a bit of direction to, the wel to welding in, in South Africa. I think it's important for women to consider careers in engineering and welding because we don't have enough engineers and we don't have enough highly skilled personnel in welding. Um, there's a perception unfortunately that women don't make good engineers and that's wrong. Um, I've seen that over many years that women make great engineers and we need more women in technical fields as a whole. Um, 
In terms of welding, we have a, a shortage of highly skilled welding personnel. We actually have a shortage of personnel over the whole range of welding professions, from welders to inspectors, supervisors, but especially welding technicians and welding engineers. There's still a perception that engineering is a male-dominated field, and to a certain extent, I guess it still is, especially in, in specific disciplines. I've been lucky though that I've never really encountered much discrimination, I've never had any real problems. Um, I've also had some really good mentors in the field who helped and supported me uh, while I was studying and also in my early career. And you sometimes do have to work a bit harder to get people to take you seriously. But all in all my journey hasn't been bad at all and I think there are now enough female engineers in industry that um, it's becoming a more acceptable career option for girls. Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Carmel. We're both second year students studying materials engineering at the University of Birmingham. We're just off to lectures now. In second year, we usually have around 11 hours of lectures a week, plus labs and tutorials. It usually takes us 15 minutes to walk to our department from Selly Oak. Do you know what's happening in the lecture today? I think we're doing polymer extrusion. It's also being opposed by the pressure towards the far end. We have a small year group, so we get a lot of interaction with our lecturers. Stephen? Yes? May I please ask a question? Of course, come out. If you have any problems, you can bring them up with your personal tutor in your weekly meetings or follow up after the lectures. Shall we head off to labs then? This is the Sharpie impact test machine. It's used to measure the impact toughness of a material. The impact toughness of a material changes with temperature, so often these tests are conducted using liquid nitrogen. Our department has a foundry. In the first year we get shown different metals being cast. This is what casting steel looks like. We also have access to up-to-date manufacturing facilities, which help reinforce what we've learned in lectures. One example of this is the Net Shaping Lab, which is used to produce components with a reduced need for final machining and surface finishing. This is 3D printing, an additive manufacturing process. Based on a computer model, layers of polymer pellets are progressively melted, laid down and cured to produce a custom solid object. At the end of the day, we often go for a drink or a meal. Most Mondays we head to the pub for a quiz. One of my favourite things about the department is that I'm good friends with all of my course mates, so we socialise a lot outside of our lectures. If I ever have any problems with the course, I have many people I can ask for help. I'm a senior materials research engineer at NASA Langley Research Center. I loved chemistry from a kid. You know, I was in the kitchen, I was always in the bathroom playing in the sink. And I had the opportunity my junior year in high school to come out and be in a summer program here at NASA Langley. And that was when my eyes were opened as to the whole realm of everything that engineering in general is. Engineers are problem solvers. And so finding solutions to problems, you know, here at NASA, we look at really hard problems to find solutions. Um, but engineers across the world are solving problems every day that help people. I've had the wonderful thrill, probably one of the highlights of my career, of getting to fly on the, um, the zero gravity aircraft, the Vomit Comet and experience zero gravity while doing experiments with the process that we had developed here in our lab in Hampton, Virginia. What we learned was things that will help astronauts and future exploration missions to be able to build and, and do repairs uh, for infrastructure on Mars, on the moon, and in the future. One of the other assignments that I've had is you know, looking at composite structures and how to build wings for next generation commercial aircraft that are more efficient. They use less fuel, 
and, and so they're more environmentally friendly, they're quieter. Most people say, oh, engineers are males. That's not the case. I am a minority. There are not as many women in engineering as men, but there are opportunities for everybody. And you know, engineering really is about you know, solving problems and thinking about people and systems and how they all fit together to make the world a better place. I am a nanomaterial scientist, which means that I work at the nanoscale, which is 100,000 times smaller than one single strand of hair. And I go down to that scale every day because the materials, once we go down there, behave far superior than anything we have in our world. So I take something like a graphite crystal, which is the centre of our pencil, and I break it from something from our world down to its nano size component. And when we do that, we have a new material called graphene, and graphene is magical. It itself conducts electricity much faster than anything. It's also the strongest material ever discovered. It's completely invisible. It's stretchy. It's super. It's just, I could go on and on. So I personally prepare the material. I break it down into its single sheets of graphene. But once we have it um, at that scale, we can mix it with polymers. And polymers are just plastics. So we can make them really, really strong by the addition of these sheets of carbon, which are the graphene sheets. There's also a field of flexible electronics. So again, mixing these nano sheets in with plastics, we can potentially run a current through a plastic such that eventually what we do hope is that they will go into the screens of computers, televisions, so that they're going to be flexible. We're going to be able to roll them up, put them in our pocket and take them back out. Let's talk about the third branch, or the engineering branch. So there are also two branches, or two entries, which are the first one is naval architecture. So for this, you should apply for the candidates' age limit to 19 to 25 years old. And it comes to notification in the month of November. और इसके लिए भी आप इंडियन नेवी के ऑफिशियल वेबसाइट पर जाकर अप्लाई कर सकते हैं और अगर बात करें इसके एजुकेशन क्वालिफिकेशन की तो इसके लिए केवल वही कैंडिडेट्स अप्लाई कर सकते हैं जिन्होंने मिनिमम 60 परसेंट मार्क्स के साथ मैकेनिकल सिविल एरोनोटिकल मेटलर्जी या फिर नेवल आर्किटेक्चर ब्रांच के साथ अपने इंजीनियरिंग की डिग्री कम्प्लीट की है तो चलिए बात करते हैं इंजीनियरिंग ब्रांच की दूसरी एंट्री की जो है नेवल आर्मामेंट इंस्पेक्टोरेट जिसे एन एंट्री के नाम से भी जाना जाता है तो इसके लिए अप्लाई करने के लिए कैंडिडेट्स की एज लिमिट साढ़े उन्नीस से 25 साल के बीच में होनी चाहिए और इसका नोटिफिकेशन भी साल में एक बार अप्रैल के महीने में आता है और इसके लिए भी आपको इंडियन नेवी की ऑफिशियल वेबसाइट पर जाकर ही अप्लाई करना होगा और अगर बात करें इसके एजुकेशन क्वालिफिकेशन की तो इस एंट्री के लिए भी केवल वही कैंडिडेट अप्लाई कर सकते हैं जिन्होंने इलेक्ट्रिकल इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स मैकेनिकल प्रोडक्शन इंस्ट्रूमेंटेशन आई केमिकल मेटल या फिर एरो ब्रांच ऐसी इंजीनियरिंग की डिग्री कम्प्लीट है तो ये थी वो एंट्रीज जिनके थ्रू फीमेल कैंडिडेट्स इंडियन नेवी को एज एन ऑफिसर ज्वाइन कर सकती हैं। 